Um, basically, I just want to uh, mention that we have Dr. Uh, Lior needs to leave um, in five minutes precisely. So if there's questions that uh, are specifically for him, now is the time. Hmm. Please. First of all, I, I was in the past. I was working in Jerusalem Institute uh, for Policy Research. We worked all, the, we dealt all the time with this question. Every meeting with Palestinians, every meeting in general about issues and all these ways why you are not voting. It's always the main question. Uh, first of all, I need to say that it's a very complicated question. Uh, first, I, first, the first point that I will never tell the Palestinians what to, to, what to do. It's part of their decision, of course. Eventually, their political uh, leadership. I think, first of all, that it's not very easy because thinking that if they will participate, as Owen mentioned. I'm quite sure that the government will do a lot of things uh, to try to challenge that. For example, demand that all of them, all the parties will say that they recognize Jew Israel as a democratic and Jewish state. And all, each party needs to recognize that, and then it means that someone that is related to Fatah, Hamas, something like that, will never be able to participate. Then they can also change the boundaries of Jerusalem to, make change, to, make, to change the demographic. Uh, so I think that, I'm not sure that, I think that if there will be a sign that they are going to vote, suddenly all of them, and there will be 40%, I'm sure that there, a lot of things will be handled, like a thing to try to address that. And there is also the discussion that we always talked about this minority of the, of the Palestinian in the Knesset, so usually they don't have any power, maybe now it's changing, but there is always people talking also about the comparison, that we can see that in the Knesset, the Palestinian, even though it's, it's different, it's 20%, they don't have much power. But there is some, we, can, we saw that the last election, there was the first time Palestinian, someone from the Palestinians that really said, I'm going to one, but it was really an internal debate in the Palestinian side. The Palestinian Authority is against that, the Hamas uh, is against that. So I'm still not sure that that will be the, the, um, the main thing that will change. It's important to say that there is another idea of creating kind, some kind of informal uh, shadow uh, Palestinian uh, municipality they are talking about for many years, but the problem that I already mentioned that there is no Palestinian leadership. I think if there will be someone like Fasih Hosseini that will say, we will vote, for example, everybody will go after him. But you need someone with authority, you need someone with legitimacy from the Ramallah, from other, and the part of the problem that there is no one that can do it. So this is part of the situation. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, also in, in what you presented, you were reflecting on the people who felt neglected, uh, or I was wondering how you all were defining, or how they defined that neglect, especially for, for example, towards the PA, the PA actually has no civil authority in Jerusalem. So I'd be very curious of what participants meant by feeling neglected by the PA, for example, in Jerusalem. Was it because of, like, political... Uh, reasoning or rationale versus how they felt neglected for the municipality that should provide services or take care of them uh, as people living with the municipality versus an authority that has absolutely no significance or power within Jerusalem. Yeah, so for the first point, the main point about uh, being neglected and discrimination, most of it was, of course, against Israel and about the municipality. So most of the points was about it, not about the Palestinian Authority. Of course, they are living in Jerusalem, and about they need to take care of them. They are Israeli residents, so most of the criticism was that they never see them as part of the city. If you will see, by the way, an election campaign in Jerusalem, nobody's talking about East Jerusalem. It's only like it's not exist. But if you are talking about the Palestinian Authority, first of all, we need to remember that according to the Oslo Accord that was signed in 93, and then after that, a few years during the 90s, the Palestinian Authority are not allowed to be in Jerusalem in any way. The Palestinian Authority should be only the West Bank and Gaza, but outside of Jerusalem. 
Even if there will be a fax that someone in the PA will send to a Palestinian institute in East Jerusalem, they can close, the police can close it. So there is also a legal issue, and you can see some events, even football games that were organized by the Palestinian Authority, and they were closed because of this law that, that was used. In the, if, if they are funding that, they can close. So there is also a legal issue. In addition to that, I think there is a lot of criticism, and you can see that in different surveys of the Palestinians, that they feel that they, have, they, don't, they hate Israel, but also saying that they don't like the PA. They also have a lot of criticism on the, on the PA. So it's interesting that they created their own Palestinian Jerusalem identity. We can sense that in a lot of meetings, that we don't like the PA, we, uh, but we don't like Abu Mazen. It's also the, the current situation of the PA. It's not maybe a state that will be in the future. We don't like Israel, of course, in the municipality. And they created their own uh, identity, and it's very interesting, but they also have a lot of problem with the Palestinian as it is right now. And that's why you heard a lot, we don't want the Abu Mazen control. We don't do this well, but we also don't like Abu Mazen. Very complicated situation. Yeah. So, any more questions? No, to everybody now. We're opening it, the floor to everybody. <laughs> so, can we hear? Yeah, please. So, Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, I think a lot of the discussion here, to varying degrees, was under the assumption that we are living in democracy. And Owen, you were the worst in that, sorry to say. So, are, are you willing to acknowledge that in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, there is no democracy? It's not a democratic regime. And how would your analysis research recommendations would change if you would acknowledge it? One doesn't like to be the worst, right? So I have to improve my... So I don't... I, I was gentle. Yeah. yeah. Well, the occupation isn't democratic, okay? And the Palestinians and East Jerusalem are not citizens. So I think this answers... Uh, that uh, question. The, the the problem is that the Palestinians, as of today, and this also relates to the previous question, do not have a state, they do not have representation. So they don't have either. And Israel can do what it wants because it can it can ha has can eat its cake and have it too. In that respect, it has no opposition, uh, no formal opposition from the Palestinian side. So what Lior and, and mentioned, or Lior and his group mentioned in the paper. And what I added to it is that maybe by participation in the municipal election, the Palestinians can uh, maybe not become citizens of Israel and enjoy the benefits of Israeli democracy, but they can participate, at least at the municipal level, in some sort of uh, democratic process. Okay? Um, and um, this reminds me of, a, of an anecdote, it's actually a, a true one. From, from Lebanon, from our neighbor, our northern neighbor, there was, uh, Lebanon is also an expanded state. It used to be uh, smaller, the Mount Lebanon, and then it annexed, uh, the French annexed all these territories uh, to Mount Lebanon, it became a divided uh, state, a divided society. And for many years, the Muslims in Lebanon boycotted the institutions of the state. Uh, the elections for parliament, the government, the presidency, the prime premiership, and so forth, until one, uh, Sunni Muslim came forward and agreed to become prime minister. Okay, and some of his peers is, uh, uh, were, were in shock. What are you doing? Uh, there's going to be an Arab unity. Uh, we can't give up our position. How can you accept the uh, artificial, uh, illegitimate Lebanese state? So he said, don't worry, if there's going to be an Arab unity, I'm going to resign. Okay. And then he went on to join the Lebanese government. So this is a very pragmatic position. If there is going to be a Palestinian state and the end of occupation, then we can resign and join that uh, Palestinian state. Uh, but until uh, we have that situation, and maybe in order to promote that situation, maybe better to, to be in than to be left out. Okay? So I can see this kind of rationale uh, also uh, uh, adopted by some Palestinians. Okay. Yeah, sure. uh, to Dr. Adis, um, we are trying to uh, probably to find uh, ways for find a mediation between uh, in in this conflict. Um, the question is um, how 
how we will find the the ways uh, for for solve this uh, uh, problem if we we don't look at uh, the most deep parts of uh, this complex. I mean, uh, if if I am a, a genetist uh, and uh, I think if you want uh, attack a problem or a mutation like uh, we have now in the society, you need to uh, see at the basis. Do you think it's possible to rebuild the basics of the uh, British school from where we, uh, the international relations are built for, for find the best ways or for mediate for between these countries? So, if I understood correctly, you're referring to these deeper issues that are uh, divisive at the level of high politics rather than at the level of how are we going to uh, talk about this greater inclusion if there is no solution at the level of high politics, if I, could, if I understand that to be the question. I mean, um, I was, uh, I was uh, researching about uh, the, the old uh, schools of international relations, mm -hmm. uh, the balance of the power. Mm -hmm. And we have a conflict here uh, with uh, this balance of the power, uh -huh. and the, the British school brings that uh, that balance uh, supposed brings that balance, and we don't have th that balance. That's for why I'm uh, asking if it's possible to rebuild the basis of this British uh, school for find the ways for mediate between these countries. Yeah, obviously this is a very asymmetrical conflict right now, right? Uh, the, the balance of power is very asymmetrical and I think that if it was different, it would, we would have a completely different situation. Uh, so what that entails, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dwell on that, but uh, what I was trying to uh, outline here when we're talking about representation in Jerusalem, uh, we have this concrete situation that has been going on for so many decades that's affecting the daily lives. <laughs> If we are waiting for this, uh, I mean, these generations are being raised in, in this type of environment, in, this type, in these types of conditions that are, uh, to what I understand, in East Jerusalem, not very good. Uh, so this is, these proposals that I discussed today are about trying to uh, create greater participation in order to improve the daily lives of citizens, but which, uh, if you're talking about, obviously it will be connected to, to high politics because the reason why there is lower participation of Palestinians is because they are, uh, they see it as legitimization of, of, of the Israeli rule. However, uh, this, is, this is going to be a process and there's been not, nothing will come overnight and uh, if whatever the solutions are, whatever institutional solutions are, whatever so, so institutional solutions uh, uh, should be, uh, such as the ones that I talked about, uh, this would require a certain period of time where actually results are uh, uh, reflected in the daily lives of citizens. If that, if at the level, initially, if we have a lower level of participation and we have legitimacy issues, but the, in the initial period shows improvement in the level of, of infrastructure, for example, in, in, in Eastern Jerusalem, if there are better roads, if there is, you know, better, um, yeah, better electricity grids, whatever they may be, perhaps that can build up legitimacy over the longer run. Uh, what, I, what I talked about in, in, in the Sarajevo case, uh, yes, we have this integration of daily life that is, uh, to the outsider, look, looks very successful and it is successful. But this didn't happen overnight either. Uh, when this, the war stopped... All citizens, because national minorities and others, they don't have the rights. Yeah, but the, I didn't want to expand the discussion because that, that's not a, a <laughs> different topic, right? Uh, um, in 1995, when the war stopped, these processes began. In 2000, you still had these, you know, these bitter animosities. But over time, as people from East Sarajevo got their jobs in, in, in Sarajevo and uh, started earning, earning salaries in Sarajevo, traveling on a daily basis, uh, the fact that there were no borders, uh, over time, this security framework that was established in the Dayton Accord started to produce, to produce results. So Sarajevo in 2019 is quite different than Sarajevo in 2009, and 2009 is quite different than 1999. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, very much for your contribution today. And, um,
by that we end this session. Actually, we have uh, 10, which was supposed to be 10. Now we only have five minutes break, uh, coffee break. And then we come back for um, basically the most interesting session. <laughs> no, no, all sessions are interesting. We're going to talk about uh, gender uh, in the city.